thanks, thanks for inviting me, and happy birthday, Bertrand. So um, I want to talk about a paper that's an archive joined with Florian Neff on torsion volume forms. So uh, throughout the talk, I'll be discussing some derived stacks. And there, there are going to be two classes of derived stacks satisfying various assumptions. And let me just begin by stating those assumptions and introducing some terminology. Um, so let's say y uh, is a derived stack, and I'll call it a reasonable stack um, if it has a perfect cotangent complex. And then another class of stacks that I'll consider, um, yeah, maybe if, you're, if you like uh, acronyms, you can call it LFP def. So it has, it admits the deformation theory and it's locally a finite presentation. Uh, and another class of stacks uh, is, I'll call a stack proper enough. And that's the following condition. So I don't have a better name, unfortunately, for this. So you look at projection, and you're required that the pullback has a left and a right adjoint. So that you have a pullback functor from sheaves on a point to sheaves on x. And you require existence of a left adjoint and a right adjoint. Let me call the left adjoint P lower sharp. And the right adjoint P lower star. And then here I assume that this, so this functor exists for uh, categorical reasons always, and I'll assume that it's calling preserving. So I'll give an example uh, of a proper stack in, in a second. But let me just say that I want to think about um, the star push forward as kind of cohomology and char push forward as homology. So uh, if you char push forward the structure sheaf, you get uh, something like homology. And if you take uh, star push forward, you get cohomology. Okay, and here's a main example to keep in mind for both classes of stacks. Let's say G is some algebraic group. And throughout, I'll be talking about uh, things in characteristic, characteristic zero. So then, um, if you just look at a classifying stack, this is reasonable. Uh, and as, as x, you can take the following. Let's say m is some finest w complex. As x, I'll take uh, what some people call the Betty stack of, of m, which just means the constant stack with the value m. And then um, in this case, if m is finest w complex, this stack is proper enough. And these uh, homology and cohomology literally become homology and cohomology of M as a topological space.
Okay, so the reason I want to consider these class of stacks is uh, I will be talking about mapping stacks. And a basic fact uh, about mapping stacks is that this mapping stack is going to be reasonable um, if y is reasonable and x is proper. Uh, in fact, it's quite easy to give a formula for the tangent and the cotangent complex of this mapping stack. So I think that's folklore. Um, uh, the formula is the following. Let's say you just write the usual correspondence for the mapping stack. If you have a map from x to y and a point of x, you can evaluate this map on the point and you get an element of y. Or you can project down to the mapping space. So then the cotangent complex is going to be homology of the pullback of the cotangent complex of y. And the tangent complex, which is the dual of that, of the cotangent complex, is going to be the cohomology of the same. Okay, and from this you can deduce that uh, the cotangent complex will remain perfect. Okay. Um, so you'll get that the cotangent complex is perfect. Uh, maybe I should put implication but in one direction. Don't you need more than the, that the cotangent is perfect? It has to commute with figure of Yeah, so let me put an uh, implication in ah. the other direction. So you, you just mean cotangent complex is perfect? Yes, yeah. that, 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 that's all, all I mean. Yeah. Oh, don't, don't waste my one. <laughs> okay. Well, Sorry. no worries. Okay, um, and so the, the, the reason I want to consider these cl classes of stacks is that I can talk about volume forms. So let me say what I mean by the volume form. So if y is reasonable, so the cotangent complex is perfect, um, you can define the canonical bundle as just the determinant of the cotangent complex. And then you can say a volume form is just a trivialization of the canonical bundle. Of course, if y is smooth, then this is the cotangent bundle. The determinant of the cotangent bundle is the top exterior power. And that's the usual definition of a canonical bundle of a smooth scheme. Um, let, let's just view this as an ungraded line, uh, as an ungraded line bundle. So, yeah. You, you could insert uh, the dimension here, the virtual dimension of y, if, if you're talking about graded lines, but I, I will not do that. Okay, and so uh, the goal 
uh, of the talk is to answer the following question. If y has a volume form, when does the mapping space have a volume form? So basically, how can you do transgression from y to the mapping space of volume forms? OK, and just uh, let me go back to the example on the middle board. Uh, the mapping space I'll be talking about in this example is the stack of local systems. So we've seen this in Carl's talk. This is the Betty side of non abelian Hodge correspondence. So this is uh, the stack of local systems. And if you forget the derived information, this is just the stack parametrizing representations of the fundamental group of, of M. Okay, so um, before answering this question, let me just give one example, one natural source of volume forms, in particular on things like mapping space, um, which comes from a theory of shift symplectic structures. So let me just um, give something easy. So let's say M is a symplectic manifold, just or a symplectic smooth scheme. Let's say omega is the symplectic form. Then one example of volume form on such a space is the symplectic volume form. So if we just take the top power of the symplectic structure, maybe divide it by some, fa by some factor, um, that's called the symplectic volume form. And uh, a basic observation is that this can be generalized to shift the symplectic structures. Namely, we prove the following basic result. That if you have any n shift the symplectic stack, And n is divisible by 4. Then y has a natural uh, symplectic volume form. So um, throughout the talk, I'll be talking about different class, um, different construction of volume forms, which is not the symplectic volume form. But if I have time at the end, I'll compare 
in one of the cases, the symplectic volume form and the volume form I'll be talking about. Okay, so to do this transgression of volume forms, um, just like in the case of shift the symplectic structures, you need extra structure on the source. Uh, in the case of shift the symplectic structures, to transgress the symplectic structure to the mapping space, you need the source to be oriented, so some kind of oriented manifold. So instead of orientation, there's going to be a, another kind of structure. So let me explain what it is. So we call this a simple structure. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, <laughs> so first of all, zero is divisible by four. Um, so that's the usual case. Um, so that's the case of ordinary symplectic structures. And then if you, th this kind of statement is really a linear algebra statement. It doesn't have anything to do with stacks. It's really like about symplectic complexes. And if you have, If you have a, an n shift the symplectic complex, then if you shift it by two, you're going to get an, well, I wouldn't get the sign right. So it's n plus minus four shifted. symplectic complex. So if you talk about linear symplectic structures, uh, they exhibit this kind of four periodicity. If you try to shift it by one, you expect to get something n plus two shifted, uh, but instead of symplectic, uh, it's symmetric. So that's why there's uh, four periodicity. Okay, so let me talk about simple structures. Uh, before I introduce them, let me say that there's two main examples that we discuss in the paper. Uh, the first example is related to what I talked about before. You start with a finest CW complex. And you consider uh, the constant stack with value m. In this case, the simple structure, and I'll be discussing this example now, um, uses the theory, so that's the reason for, the, for this terminology, uses the theory of simple homotopy types. Um, Due to Whitehead. So I'll, I'll say more about this in a second. Let, let me give another source of uh, stacks which have uh, simple structures. So I'll say M is just some smooth and proper scheme. And as the stack, you take the Durham stack of M. So it's an, whatever this is, it's some stack such that quasi coherent sheaves here will be D modules on M. And in this case, you, uh, the relevant uh, simple structure has been constructed using um, what's called the theory of epsilon factors. Um, okay, this is due to Patel and Groshenig. Uh, 
Okay, so the, the constructions are fairly independent, but to uh, be somewhat concrete, I'll just be talking about the topological case. So just start with the finest W complex. Okay, so let's say M is a topological space. And really, when I say topological space, I just mean the homotopy type. Or anima, as some people like to call it. Okay, so um, to this topological space, you can associate a kind of K theory, um, which is called the A theory of M. Let me give a few, um, a few ways to think about this. So one way to define it is you take the K-theory of a stable infinity category, which is the stable infinity category of uh, parametrized spectra over, over M. If, you're, if you don't like stable infinity categories, well, maybe you should learn them, but another way to define it um, is to take a ring spectrum, which is the base loop space. So let's say M is connected. Uh, so you take the base loop space of M and turn it into ring spectrum. Okay, so this is uh, Walthausen's A theory. Okay, so let me define uh, what it means to have a simple homotopy type structure on M. Uh, to define that, I first need to introduce a finiteness assumption on M. So let me denote the infinity category of spaces by S. So if you like, this is the infinity category of con complexes. So I'll say that M is finitely dominated um, and so one of the equivalent definitions is that it's just a compact object of this infinity category so there's some finiteness condition on this topological space And so for, for finitely dominated spaces, you can define the simple structure or the, the data of, be, of this M being simple homotopy type as follows. Um, there's a map that maybe I will not explain unless you, you ask me more details about it. So there's something called the assembly map. From Let me write it in two ways. You can look at homology of M with coefficients in a certain spectrum, which is a theory of the point, going to a theory of M. So this is called the assembly map. Uh, the reason it's called assembly map, it's a theory, so you have some, something parameterized by M that's kind of global information and you're trying to encode this global information by local information, some homology on M. So it assembles global information from some local information. And so if M is finally dominated, there is a canonical element in the A theory. Yes, so you can say this, this map is, uh, you approximate A by a colimit preserving functor. So if A is finally dominated, there is an element in the A theory 
So one equivalent definition of A theory is just the K theory of Pantry spectra. You can look at the constant sheaf here. which is going to be compact. So it's going to define a point in A theory. And this is kind of a universal Euler characteristic. So if you project down to a point, you just get the usual Euler characteristic of M, which is a numerical invariant. So you can project down to, let's say, pi naught of A of the point, uh, which is Z. Uh, so out of this element in A theory, you get a number. This number is just the usual Euler characteristic. The finite dom domination assumption tells you that you can actually compute this Euler characteristic. It's a finite number. OK, and then uh, a simple structure on M, by definition, uh, no, this is the class of just the constant uh, parameter spectrum. So it's the data of a lift of this Euler characteristic, which is some global invariant, to a local invariant, something in homology. Uh, to some element uh, along this assembly map, let me call this element the Euler class. OK, so lo this looks pretty abstract. Um, so here I define the whole space of simple homotopy types. And there are various theorems describing what the space is. Um, so the space um, is described using what's called the h coborism theorem, or parameterized h coborism theorem. But let me not uh, get there. Okay, so it's the data of a lift of this, uh, of the constant sheaf along the assembly. So let me say um, so, so somewhat more concrete. Um, so how to say something more concrete about this simple structure. So first of all, if M is a finite CW complex, uh, in particular, it's going to be finely dominated. You can talk about uh, assembly and the, these lifts. So, so finite CW complex has a simple structure. has such a lift. And if you have a homotopy equivalence, all finest double complexes
Um, you can measure how the simple structures change under this homotopy equivalence. So this notion of a simple structure is not homotopy invariant. Um, so basically, you can measure. So the this A theory group and the assembly is a totally homotopy invariant notion, and this Euler characteristic in A theory is also a homotopy invariant notion. But the lift is not a homotopy invariant notion. You can measure how the lift changes. Um, and the lift will, in general, change by what's called the whitehead torsion of the homotopy equivalence. Um, the data of a, finis, uh, of a simple structure on a given finite, finite, finite dominant space. Or so T of F depends on the on choices? And on the choice of a finite CW structure, yes. So once you have a semi composition, you have a unique simple structure? Or let's say canonical. Like the, canonical yeah, one, yeah. Okay. okay, so yeah, in, in, uh, and if you have a homotopy equivalence, uh, it, this simple structure will change by this whitehead torsion. If you just start unpacking what these various groups uh, are. So how, how does it change? It's, it's going to change by some k1 element. Um, but because you're talking not about just trivializing something in A theory, but about lifts, it's defined up to some ambiguities. And this quotient of, of k1 is called a whitehead group. OK, so that's, uh, that's what the whitehead torsion gives you. And that's just how this simple structure changes. OK. OK, so that's how it works for topological spaces. As I said, uh, what we do is we uh, generalize this notion of a simple structure to stacks. Uh, so that for the constant stack, the simple structure just becomes lift um, of this Euler characteristic along the assembly. Um, but yeah, uh, it can be generalized to arbitrary stacks. But uh, again, I want to emphasize this is extra structure on a given uh, stack. So if you don't want to think about general stacks, just think about constant stack for topological space. OK. So now, finally, let me state uh, the theorem about torsion volume forms. OK, so let's say y is a reasonable stack. So you, you have a notion of volume form, x proper enough. And there is a simple structure on x. So for instance, it's a Betty stack of a finite CW complex. OK, so uh, choose two pieces of data. So the first piece of data looks fairly small, and it's just to fix some science. Namely, you take homology uh, of x to the power of the dimension of y. Uh, so that's some line. And you choose a trivialization of this line. 
So just non-zero vector in this one-dimensional space. Uh, okay, so that's one piece of data you need to choose. The second piece of data is more significant. So you choose either a volume form on Y or you choose some data on X Namely, you have um, the Euler class, you have access to the Euler class of X. So I'll say in a second what it is. Um, so when I talked about simple structures, there was, um, there was a data of a lift of this class of the constant sheaf along the assembly. So there's a the kind of k-theoretic Euler class, which is provided by the theory of once since you have a simple structure, and you can forget k-theory to just the integers. So you have this complex, and you have an element in this complex. You can choose a null homotopy of this element. So that's second piece of data. I was hoping that I would be able to finish it here. So let's say then maps from x to y has a volume form. Okay, so the upshot is that if you have this simple structure, if you have some data on y, namely the volume form, or some data on x, you get a volume form on a mapping space. Exactly. But do you say what data you need to describe on the property not stack for the... Well, it's the simple structure, the, the lift. Right, but, but for the CW complexes, you said that the cell decomposition actually gives you a lift. That's right. Is there something like that on the property not stack? No, so it's, it's just that, I, that there isn't anything like, like that. It's, there's just examples, like a Durham stack and Betty stack. Um, yeah, if you have a CW structure on... on on a homotopy type, or you have a smooth proper scheme. Yeah, so if you have a finite CW complex, you have a canonical uh, simple structure. Say, say it again. You have an action? Yeah. And that's compatible with your CW. Ah, um, yeah, yeah it, it, if it, it, by compatible you mean cellular? Yeah. yeah so, so yeah, uh, cellular maps have uh, zero torsion. Um, Natalie? Yes, no? Uh, I, I think so. Um, So yeah, more generally, homeomorphisms have uh, zero torsion. So that's maybe a non-trivial result.
OK. So the obvious next step is to just give some examples. So let me do that. And so in this talk, let me just talk about examples, uh, just topological examples. So you start with the source being a, a manifold, let's say. Uh, well, you can talk about one-dimensional manifolds. You have something related to the thought class. You have two-dimensional manifolds. In two dimensions, you can relate distortion volume form to symplectic volume form. And there are three dimensional examples uh, related to cohomological DT theory. Um, so I will not have time to talk about all three, and I will let Bertrand choose which one he wants to hear about. <laughs> which one is the most complicated? Um, I would like to hear about one, at least. Great. Oh, sorry. So, so, great. Uh, yeah, let's start with one, and then see if we have time. OK, so um, by one-dimensional example, I just mean Let's look at maps from the circle into Y. So there are not many closed-oriented one-manifolds. But let's take the circle. Uh, so that's the derived loop space of Y. All right, so if you look at this theorem, um, well, what, what do I need? I need, I need a simple structure on the source. Well, this is a finite CW complex, so it ha you have a simple structure. And then I need either a volume form on Y or a trivialization of the Euler class. S1 has zero Euler characteristics, so you have a trivialization of the Euler class. So in this way, what you get is a torsion um, volume form on the loop space. OK, so that's, uh, that's something. Now, you want to get some uh, understanding of this torsion volume form. And one way to get uh, understanding of this torsion volume form is to relate the loop space to something simpler. Uh, since I'm in characteristic zero, I'll use HKR, and I'll identify this with shift tangent bundle. And for this, let me just write some correspondences. So the loop space, because Y is just a general stack, the loop space is not the same as shift tangent bundle. But you can do the following. So the circle, which is the classifying stack of the integers maps to BGA. Uh, you have a map from the integers to GA. And another thing that maps to BGA is B of the formal group of GA.
Okay, so let's uh, let's take this correspondence of sources and let's apply mapping space. So then you get um, correspondence of mapping spaces. So the top one doesn't have a name. Let's call it this the unipotent loop space. Uh, it maps to the usual loop space. And it maps, if you, you, you can compute maps from BGA hat into Y, that's going to be a shifted tangent bundle. OK, and another thing that's uh, relatively easy to show is that both maps are actually formally tall. So the tangent complexes are the same. OK, so, so far I have a volume form on the loop space. You can actually get quite easily a volume form um, for BGA hat, namely um, BGA hat has a unique simple structure. So there's actually no choices involved. And so in this way, you get a volume form on the shifted tangent bundle. OK, so now you've got two volume forms. And these maps are formally tall, so you should think local diffeomorphism. So you can pull them back to the unipotent loop space, and you can compare the two volume forms. So this one is the stupid one, right? It's just the uh, determinant of e minus 1 is determinant of e to 2 by 1. Yes, so uh, both of them are stupid, but in, for different reasons. Okay. Uh, both of them are compatible with the natural group structures. Yeah. This one is really stupid, I mean. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, so this is an abelian group, uh, and it's a translation variant volume form respect to that abelian group structure. Uh, this, the volume form on LY, you can prove that it's actually the also compatible with the group structure, which is not abelian in general. OK, so you, yeah, you, you can look at the ratio. The ratio is going to define some function on the loop space, on the unipotent loop space. Um, so the ratio, namely, the ratio of the two volume forms. So it defines an invertible function on the unipotent loop space. Now on the unipotent loop space, well, you can actually um, formally complete this and just identify it with a formal completion of uh, the tangent bundle. And the, again, this map is formally tall, so you can pull back this function to the, uh, this tangent bundle. And the theorem is that this ratio is uh, the Todd class of y. So they do another, they, they have, um, they, they're talking about another source of volume forms. So uh, as Bertrand, well, let's talk about here. So Bertrand said that this is an abelian group over Y. So you can induce a volume form via group, group invariance. Uh, there's another um, group structure, which is, again, uh, abelian group structure. And sorry, not abelian group structure, but you can get an invariant volume form here. Uh, and they compare 
the two volume forms using that uh, formalism. Uh, we proved that these torsion volume forms are group invariant. So indeed, you can just use what they proved. Uh, but I, I just want to explain a very simple computation of this ratio uh, without using the fact that these are group invariant. That's right. Can you also link it to the hunter? I mean, is there a way to make it a kind of line? Um, possibly. Um, yeah, you, you need to show that, well, yeah, yeah probably you, you need, um, pr probably you, you need to establish various kind of formality results. So you want to show that this diagram itself is, uh, is invariant under some group action. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, so I, th I think the answer is yes. But is the theorem still true? Because if you compare non-equivalency, it doesn't mean that you have equivalency, right? Ah, uh, yeah, but, but it's just uh, everything is, like BGA acts on BGA. It's, uh, everything is, is a group. Yeah. And the, these uh, torsion volume forms are invariant under that natural well, group action. I understand, but the comparison is a comparison between a function and the top class in the non-equivalency. Yeah, non yeah, I, th I think the, the proof that I'll write in a second yeah, but uh, we haven't done it. We, we just sh show it in, in, in functions. So let, let me just give an idea. And for this, I will just explain what are, uh, like very concretely, what are these simple structures that you see. Okay, so the first goal is to just understand what are sheaves on these various spaces. Because you, you want to take K theory at some point. Well, uh, sheaves on S1, these are local systems on S1, so they're representations of the final group. So you can say these are modules over um, the algebra of Laurent polynomials. Okay, so you can do, you can do similar computation for BGA hat, uh, and what you get is modules over just polynomials. And you can also do the computation of BGA. And you can get sort of two versions of the same category. One of them is you look at modules over Kx, which is supported at x equals to 0. Or you can say these are modules over KZZ inverse, and they're, they're supported at Z is equal to 1. So what are these simple structures? So I need to know, uh, I need to have a trivialization of the structure sheaf in K-theory. And what is the structure sheaf in K-theory here? The structure sheaf, for instance, uh, for the circle is going to be the skyscraper at z equals equal to 1. And same thing for just polynomials. So how do you construct this? Well, the skyscraper has a resolution. It has a two-term resolution by three modules. 
So if you think the, uh, of this uh, expression in terms of k-theory, you get a difference of the same module, so this gives you zero. So that constructs for you a null homotopy in k-theory of, um, of the circle. You can do the same computation for BGA hat. And again, uh, there's a null homotopy, so these are going to be zero. And then you can compare them. In K theory of the formal completion. So you either complete uh, Kx at, at equals, equals to zero or Kzz inverse at z, at z equals to one. So you have null homotopies of the same element. So this gives you an element in K1. And what is that element in K1? Um, well, it's really going to be, the, if you do the computation, it's going to be the ratio of these differentials. Uh, and what is K1 of uh, Laurent polynomials, uh, sorry, uh, formal power series? This is going to be the units. Um, in formal power series. So you get exactly the Todd genus as this difference. OK, so this is how uh, you do this comparison universally, just in K theory. And then that sort of, if you unpack what this computation is doing, that will, uh, on the geometric level, will tell you what the ratio of the volume forms is. OK, so I'm going to stop here. Thanks.